Hey guys, so today I'm gonna to talk Serious Business, which is my Magic the Gathering store. I think it will continue, but not in its current format, which is having two part-time employees who also work at my marketing agency. We had a meeting with my core team. Uh, my core team, Norman, the developer, has been with me for seven years. Niha and Wasim have been with me for five, and Jess has been with me for three and a half, almost four years. So I do trust them, and they are have been the core members of the team since the very get-go of even the software company. So I trust their opinions. They don't like the Magic the Gathering model because it is putting a burden on the marketing agency. So in case you guys don't know, the marketing agency shares a, quote, office with the Magic the Gathering model. And whenever you have like events and stuff, it creates a not a great work atmosphere. And this is probably because I needed to actually find a second venue. But the office is so big that in my marketing agency, no one uses it. It's a 3,500 square feet for seven people. That's really, really big. The core problem of the Magic the Gathering store, it's two problems. One, Wizard of the Coast is making it difficult. Uh, there's no reason that a casual player or any player would want to buy Magic cards from a physical store when they can buy from the Hasbro store and get guaranteed Planeswalkers rather than take a chance. The other bad part about owning a physical store is if you do want to become a WPN, you have to offer your store during certain hours. And these hours are largely after hours. If you think about it from a regular business, uh, most businesses are not open from 7 until 2 a.m. at night. And you have to pay someone and then you have to pay them to lock up and that's always a big concern because, again, they would be locking up the marketing agency and the Magic the Gathering. We tried two FNMs in the month of January. Uh, we had some good people, mostly my friends. Uh, even then, it's A, not profitable. I will document the actual profitability on my other channel, but I can tell you it's not nearly profitable. A lot of you say, oh, people buy soda, people buy chips, and... They don't buy that much of that, right? <laughs> they tell me so much sodas and chips and sleeves that somebody would buy. Out of 10 people, maybe a few of them buy some snacks, but it's not like everyone's lined up to buy snacks. The current structure of the prizes means that you have to actually give out. So whatever the player base puts in, you have to give out in terms of store credit or in some cases, cash equivalent. Now, we don't have that many singles, and the singles we do have are reserve list cards, and therefore they're not exactly... It's not a good deal for me to sell you a reserve list card because it can go up in price. And I, that, I've had that happen many times. And yes, it's cash in hand versus the potential for... But I think at this point, we all know reserve list cards under a dollar will be over a dollar within the next five years. It's just obvious that every single one of them is gonna spike at some point in time. For instance, Mana Servants, I believe is on the reserve list. Um, it is from Visions. It went from five cents to $10 and now it's back to $5. Ignore the $10, $5 is still very good. And if you sold it for 25 cents, you look like an idiot. So back onto how the local game stores are doing. Uh, they're doing very poor. Uh, two local game stores, which my friends own, they we looked at the magic numbers when they were both running magic and both of them decided not to do any magic, not based on like, just because their gut feeling. I think they at one point could tell that it wasn't worth the effort to become a WPN. Both stores wore WPN stores at the time and they just decided, nope, no mass. Now, some of the promos, the uh, showdown packs and the play mats and I mean, you can buy them online. So there are YouTubers like Unsealed MTG who I assume buys it from his friend the day they come out. 
he was able to get the showdown packs for Ravnica Allegiance. And I'm not talking about Ravnica Allegiance packs. I'm talking about showdown packs before the pre-release kits. So there is easy access to that product. It's not like it's exclusive in any way. You just ask a store owner, they'll sell it to you because they don't really care about their player base anyway. Because th these products that are supposedly going to the players as extra rewards are not going to the players and they never will under these models because your, your store is operating paycheck to paycheck. Now, go back to the second problem. The second problem is the overhead and employee is just too much. Like maybe if you were to run it yourself, that would be okay if you didn't pay yourself, of course, if you didn't pay yourself anything. But at my marketing company, we have, and I extended it to whatever ventures I go out to, our minimal wage is $15 an hour. Uh, we kept that in place after the buyout was over. So from July 2018 and on, that was the minimal wage. And I don't feel like I should change that in the future because that makes sense to me. Uh, I would much rather have a living wage, I believe. Now, $15, you can argue, is actually too low for a living wage. But eventually, the person becomes W-2 and they pay taxes and da 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 so actually, the overhead in that person will go up to $20, $21 actually, based on what the company actually pays. But anyway, for, for the sake of this particular venture, it's $15 an hour. If you put a person from 6 p.m. until, let's say, you play FNM until midnight, let's say you shut down at midnight, that's six hours, that's 90 bucks. There's no way you're making $90 that night. Because to make $90, you have to sell about $300 of retail merchandise. That's what you. That's what costs. And I'm not considering tax. I haven't considered any of these aspects that happen normally at the end of the year, at the end of the fiscal year. I'm just talking about pure profit. What your break even for that one employee would be is you need to sell $300 retail to justify that one employee just for his salary. Now, when you put in electric, water, um, damages that happens, I mean, it's a lot of damage happens in the store. That's some, something that I did not account for uh, when you have stolen merchandise and or damaged merchandise. Um, it's really funny when you think about it because the people who play Magic are so picky on conditions. But when they're looking at your comic books, when they're looking at your anime figures, they'll have Cheeto dust and, you know, it's like a $400 figure and now it's harder to sell and you have to clean it. The mistake I made was I assumed that we could justify this full-time employee or this combination of employees working 60 hours because they would also be doing online sales, but they just don't have the talent. There's not, they're not good at it. So frankly, frankly speaking, they just don't, it's not an education. I think it's more like, hey, are you lazy? Or are you not lazy? Can you please post, continue to post stuff on Facebook Marketplace, Mercario? Can you post stuff on eBay? Can you post stuff on our Facebook pages? And uh, the answer is no, because they're just sitting there and enjoying the good life. So I'm going to let it go for one more month, uh, one more February, give you an update then. And if you're interested in the exact numbers and my more um, aggressive feelings, if you will, you can go on my other channel. But it's not going well. Uh, the overhead is, the overhead shouldn't be a big deal. Like it's so strange that the overhead is a big deal because in a marketing company, you always, every employee I have is profitable. Every vendor I have is pro every 1099 is profitable. But in the magic thing, you just cannot sell enough. Um, you cannot sell enough magic. It, I think it comes down to your, it's one thing to compete against the local store next to you. I think we can out compete them. It's another thing to compete against Rudy online. It's another thing to complete compete against Amazon or you know, Amazon direct selling and or this distributor car sports and more, which is selling at like border, like crazy prices. And it's another thing when you compete against Wizards of the Coast Hasbro store itself. As long as Hasbro can continues to sell Mythic Editions, I don't see why anyone would want to buy a box. So let's say $250, you get eight Mythic Planeswalkers, which is good for casual players. And what, what do you get? 24 packs? 
So let's say you get 24 packs. Why would anyone buy a box? What's your best case scenario for two boxes in a fat pack or two and a half boxes? If you sell a box for 100 bucks, you make maybe $20. Maybe $20 if you're lucky. So you make 20 bucks off two box. You make 40 off two boxes at 100 and then you make let's say another let's say you make $50 profit on selling two and a half boxes but that person buying those two and a half boxes they're not going to get eight mythic planeswalkers forget about them being four r and foil they're not going to get even eight mythics they might not even get eight mythics total to be honest right or from the two and a half boxes so why would they ever if their minimal is eight mythic planeswalkers plus 24 packs why would they go with uh what's it 72 plus 18 um 90 packs it makes no sense like it, it literally makes no sense because in 90 packs you're not going to pull eight planeswalkers and that's who you're competing with in the future trust me when i say this mythic edition is not going to be the only thing we sell from our ebay hasbro store it's a real store they're selling my little pony i mean this might be the first time they showed magic, but it's not the first time they showed everything else. Transformer, My Lobe, everything else is in this store. Why wouldn't they just sell a booster box for $78 and be done with it? Right? Like, why would they? They wouldn't even need to sell it for $78. That's the distributor price. They could sell it for whatever they sell it to the distributor. What, like $60? So that's the future of this game is uh, Wizard Coast. I think eventually the end game is we sell the specialty sets or the sets everyone wants directly on our eBay store. And that's the end of that. And no store can compete against that because you need margins. The problem is your store needs margins to hire the employees to pay the overhead. Otherwise, it cannot provide a place for you to play. And I would not be surprised if more and more stores decide to drop magic because it's not worth the play area. That space has a certain cost associated and tied down to the rent. So when we we pay twenty five hundred dollars for the rent and then some money for utilities, internet, cable, all. So let's say we pay one dollar square feet, and we're using, I would say, a thousand square feet. Well, we're paying a thousand dollars in rent for just this magic area you have to justify that cost. And when you pay employees $15 an hour, you have two of them, they work 60 hours, that's $750. This is, doesn't consider the W-2. This doesn't consider any of the tax impl implications, which are massive. So 750 times four weeks, at least four weeks in a month, right? Means that you're paying at least $3,000 for the employees to be there. So liability insurance, on-premise insurance, all these little minor issues, they do add up. And at the end of the day, uh, I don't think Magic as a game can survive. I don't think a game store that only does Magic or does Magic heavily can survive in the next five years. The money doesn't make sense. I know how they are currently surviving. They're currently surviving at a loss. They're taking loans because banks will give you loans. Banks will give you loans on this. They're taking loans, they're taking personal money, and eventually they're going to go broke because there's no... If your model... Rudy's model has very low overhead. That's how he does it. He doesn't have employees, which is the largest source of overhead. He treats his place as a warehouse. It's not located in a prime location from what I can tell. And... He doesn't sell cards physically at his store. So he himself isn't there unless he's like shipping orders. The online model works because you can work whenever you want. You can wait until you have enough orders and do it all at one time. And it's more efficient. My distributor is not worse than Rudy's distributors. Um, it is the same people who do Walmart. My distributor is the same person who d does Walmart because my CFO who is an interesting guy, my former CFO, at least at my software company that we sold, he 
his uncle works at Walmart and they set me up with this kind of system where I just get prices whatever Walmart is paying for and it works well. So, I mean, if I can't make money at that margin, I don't know. Like I'm going to give it probably at least one more month, maybe two more months before I drop the employee type of thing because I think that's the biggest overhead. Everything else is you know, inventory, right? And the inventory is coming at me cheap enough that even if I just want to use it for my personal inventory, yeah, it's a good price. It's a really good price. It's two twenty five dollars for Blister Pack, and it's gone up seven fifty dollars at Planeswalker Deck. It went, it was seven. 2019, things went up in price, of course. Uh, it's unfortunate I didn't get to feed very much in the 2018 prices. I didn't get feed at all in 2017. If you guys remember in 2017, we hired someone and <laughs> a lot of inventory went missing from this person. Uh, and then, so I stopped ordering inventory. Anyway, that's it, guys. Just giving you an update on my store. Bye, guys.